four. Appreciate you standing in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Do we have any first-time visitors this morning? Anyone? You have to excuse me. I'm the new pastor, so I'm still trying to uh, figure out who's who. So are there any first-time visitors or are none? All right. Well, thank all of you faithful people for being here this morning. Acts chapter 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Verse 4, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for everyone that's here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, that you'd show us truth from your word. If anyone here is wondering, maybe they're not 100% for sure that when they die, they would go to heaven. I pray this morning, Lord, the Holy Spirit of God would convict their hearts and they would awake to the truth and understand their need of salvation, which is through your son, Jesus Christ. It's our faith and trust in your son who's already done the work on the cross of Calvary. We just must believe in that, Father. I pray that you'd help us to understand that. Father, those of us that are already saved, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, stir our hearts. Maybe we need some conviction. We need some challenging. Whatever it is, I pray that we would respond to the preaching of the Word of God. And Lord, that we would boldly listen and boldly make the application of the Word of God to our lives. Thank you so much for all that you do, have done, and will continue to do. We love you. Thank you for your love to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Who likes to be wrong? Oh, there's two back there. All three. All right. So there's three people that like to be wrong. Well, then you'll do good when you get married. (laughs) Just teasing. (laughs) Just teasing. Most of us don't like to be wrong, right? We want to be right. We want... Uh, sometimes it's the wrong right, that pride gets in there, but sometimes it's the right right, and we want to be right. But what's most important that I hope to um, uh, really convey this morning is that we understand we must be right in His eyes. Okay, the truth be told, I know sometimes I'm probably the worst of it, uh, when you fight or there's a, uh, a communication discussion at home, we'll just say an argument, Uh, When you're at home and there's a difference of opinion, many times both individuals want to be right. And it's hard to humble ourselves and say, okay. I had a friend of mine, hopefully you'll meet him one day in the future, we we call his name is Pops. Really we we say that he's our adopted dad. He's our adopted dad. Uh, When I was in the Marine Corps, left uh, to go over seas. Uh, he really took up and just helped out in the family. Anyway, I forgot where I was going with that. Well, my mind is just slipping. Was that talking? Oh, about being right. That's right. So he told me when I got married, uh, I'm sorry, when we met him and we were there at church, he said, I'm just going to give you some advice. He says, just learn these three words. You're right, dear. Amen. <laughs> we got an amen back there. So I'm still learning. I'm still learning, so just pray for me with that. But we want to be right, don't we? We want to be right. But it's most important that we're right in the eyes of God. And why is that? Well, the Bible teaches that there's a judgment one day that's coming in the future. Uh, There's no individuals that are going to miss out on that judgment. right? The Bible tells us, as is appointed once to man to die after this, the judgment. So we'll go before God. Two judgments, really, if you look at Scripture, you will find that there is a great white throne judgment. And those, or that judgment, will see to who is put down in the Lamb's book of life. Or we would say that those who have believed and trusted in Jesus Christ that have been saved will not be at that judgment. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because I know their result is they are cast into a lake of fire because they're judged for their works. So we know that that group uh, is going to go down to a devil's hell because of their lack of faith and trust 
in Jesus Christ. So we don't want to be at that judgment. There is a way to avoid that judgment. We'll see in Scripture, I already told you, it's salvation. But there's another group of individuals that will be at a judgment, which is called the judgment seat of Christ, also known, uh, it's known as the Bema seat of Christ. That one is going to be for what we have done in our lives. The Bible says whether good or bad. Now I know the word right is not there, but we would understand that good would be associated or would be the similar to right. So in other words, when we go before God, we want to be Right. Now that might seem strange as we think about a, a God that's lifted and high and mighty that we cannot see, that we cannot hear audibly, and we would wonder, how can that be possible, me as a human or as a mankind? Or as David said, what is man? As he's looking out at the stars in the universe thinking that, you know me, God? Yeah, but that God will have us to stand before Him in a judgment. And we might be wondering, well, how do we know the appropriate way? How are we going to pass? How are we going to do good in that judgment? How is that going to be possible? And thank God He's preserved His Word and given that to us, right? You can look later. I think that they have the Scripture. But in Romans chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says that there will be a judgment according to truth. So we can know that test if you will. We can know that. We can be for sure that we know what the judgment will be. There's no wondering. There's no guessing. We can know. The Bible says, according to truth. So what's truth? It's not just because I stand here and I'm Pastor Dean Francini and I am truth. No. It's not what the world may teach because it constantly changes, right? Science and different ideas, it's constantly changing. So we would wonder, what is that absolute truth? And Jesus Christ said Himself in John chapter 17, 17, Thy word is truth. So we know the spoken word or what Jesus Christ Himself has said, that's truth. We say, okay, well, Jesus Christ is not here now. No, but he's recorded down in Scripture and preserved that all through time that we can have the Word of God to be able to read it, to understand, say, this is truth. Let me shortcut the thing. When I stand before God on that test day, I have the answers. Let me say it another way. When I go before God and He says, okay, let me know what you've done good. Let me know what you've done bad. We can't say, well, I don't know. Uh, surely you can say, I know, because the Word of God has given me how I'm to live and how I'm to serve. Now, I'm thankful that the Bible tells me how I know for sure I can be right in the eyes of God for salvation, because that's what's most important here this morning, is that everyone knows that they are saved according to Scripture. Because there's many different ways that the world teaches to be saved. I'm just going to let you know there's one way. And Jesus Christ is that way. Right? He told us in the Bible that He is the door. Well, that's pretty simple. Even this old Marine can understand that. A door? Oh, I walk through the door. There's one way in. Now, I know Marines might blow up the walls and try to tear, tear up different things. I understand that. But the door is there. You walk through the door. So now I understand. If I want into the pasture, as God explains it in the Scripture, the one way there is Jesus Christ. He's very simple in that explanation. It's one, it's Him. Now again, you can try to go before God and cheat on the test, but you have the answers. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Not me, Dean Francini. He's talking about Jesus Christ Himself. One way. It's a faith and trust in Him. Then we become righteous in the eyes of God. Look with me in Romans chapter 6. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. So the first thing we want to see is, are we right? Are we right for salvation? So the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, let's see, let's pick up in verse 3. Verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? That's a good question, right? Because we've just seen in Romans chapter 2 
Verse 2, I'm going to be judged according to truth. We know that truth is Jesus Christ's spoken word. We know that is also called Scripture, Bible, Word of God, whatever you want to put in that. But it's absolute truth. So in other words, God is saying, let me give you, let me show you how is the way. That's what he's saying. Verse 3, what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay? Some deep theology. What did he do to receive righteousness? It's not up there. He believed. Period. John chapter 3, you'll find, I think, four or five times. Believe, you're good to go. Don't believe, you're not good to go. Now remember, it's his test. It's his judgment. We're going before So we want access to heaven. It's by believing. That's what's counted unto righteousness, it tells us. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Well, that lines up with Scripture, right? Ephesians, you'll find where uh, faith, uh, grace, it's a gift. It's not of works, very simply spoken. And he tells us the same here. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Let me simplify this. When I go before God, he says, you want into heaven? I say, yeah, I want in. He says, how do you get in? I say, well, the Bible says by faith. I trusted in your son, Jesus Christ. He's going to say, pass the test. I'm in by faith because now I'm right in His eyes. Salvation is very important. Number two, we want to serve right. Used to say, I'd tease sometimes and say, what is different is not the same. (laughs) Right? If it's different, it's not the same. Common sense tells us that. There's a right way to get to heaven. There's a wrong way. There's a right way to serve and there's a wrong way. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. God provided for us a way really to group up as a family, if you will. Uh, The church family, which Christ himself died for. The local New Testament church. And through that local New Testament church, we're supposed to be serving. We're supposed to be serving. Look in chapter 14, verse 12. The Bible says, Even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Okay, the church. To save time or not, but you can look later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It talks about God sets the members in the church. So it's very important that we understand serving right in His eyes must be through the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, what's it say? There be glory in the church. So you understand the body of the local New Testament church is God's design, if you can say it that way, God's plan for His people who are saved to serve Him. There's a right way. There's a wrong way. Why do you think that when people get saved, they're not told in the Scripture to stay at home and thank the Lord for that? No. They're to now get involved in the church and begin to serve, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what He told the disciples. Remember before He he left out of this world. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He wants everyone to know Him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants because that's righteous in His eyes. His eyes. So salvation needs to be according to Scripture. Serving needs to be according to Scripture. Go back with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. So we understand there's a right way of salvation, and that's only through Jesus Christ, and that's by faith. We understand there's one way to serve, and that truly is through the local New Testament church. Now, Paul is writing this letter... Thessalonians, we're going to go there in just a moment. Here is where the church really starts. Acts chapter 17, we read it. I want to go back, I can find my place, hang on. Acts chapter 17. Now here Paul shows up to this town. What's he do? He preaches the gospel. 
That's what he does. He preaches. He says he reasoned with them out of Scripture. The judgment test, if you will, or how they would be right in the eyes of God when they go before God. He reasons with them out of Scripture. Not his own words, not his own ideas. He uses the Word of God. He reasons with them. And what happens is he tells them about Jesus Christ must suffer. He must die, bury, and rise again. What do they do to become saved? Verse 4 told us very clearly, they believed. They believed that what? The message was that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was for their salvation. So they believe that. Now they're saved. Then it uses the word consorted. C-O-N-S-O-R-T. Consorted. Which means joined up or associated with. In other words, they began to believe the same. Hmm. They began to do what they have seen Paul do. Now, not every individual that shows up to tell you they're from Jesus Christ is truly from Jesus Christ, right? Paul fought that in his day, talking about false prophets. I just let everybody know, you can identify who false prophets are by knowing the Word of God. It's the truth. The same one that IDs us to that false prophet is the same book that provides for me the answers to pass the test when I go before God. So Paul preaches the gospel, they get saved. Can I tell you a second way, just kind of to veer off the message that we know that we're right, is the actions of the individual. Now I'm going to show you in just a minute the right actions, but I want you to see the wrong actions. Look in verse 5. Verse 5, Acts, Acts chapter 6, 17, verse 5. The Bible says, to those that believe not... But the Jews which believe not moved with envy and took upon them certain uh, lewd fellows of baser sort and gathered together a company and set on the city of an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason. Let me just, they got angry. They got angry and went against the house of Jason. And if you read that chapter, you'll find that Jason was where uh, really the establishment of the church, the people gathered together. They're mad because they have believed and now they're going against them with envy. I looked at that word because I'll always make jokes. I'm a Marine. We weren't the smartest ones, but we're the, we're the toughest ones. Just saying. So envy. I know I got the Navy. I got the Navy guy back there. Envy. Envy means that sometimes a person has a misconceived idea, a misconceived idea that that person is above them. Now, it's interesting because here, when you find that they believe, they found truth, they know the truth. So in the eyes of being righteous, in the eyes of God, they are right and above them, but they're angry because they don't believe, so now they're causing division. They're causing anger. They're busybody backbiting, and here, unfortunately, they physically assault the house of Jason and those believers there. And you'll find that Paul and Silas and Timothy have to leave because of the uproar that's happening in the city. They had envy against them. They had truth. Don't take this the wrong way, but sometimes not everyone's going to believe the same. That's fine. You have the options and the choices to say, I believe what's being preached and taught. I believe the Word of God. And if not, then you, know, you have the option to go and find another place that you feel is truth. But don't cause division and assault the house of the Lord. Right? Just be careful in that. But we know that they were right because of the anger and the fight against them. It's funny because their truth that's being preached is a loving gospel. It's never been a, a mean gospel. They're preaching truth. Some believe, others don't. The group that doesn't believe gets upset and goes against them. So how do those people... Let me just say, we'll test it. How do you know that I am teaching and preaching truth? How do you know that he is teaching and preaching truth? How did they know to be saved that what Paul was teaching and preaching was truth? I'm glad you asked that. Let's look. The authority was right. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So we can find how, or find out, 
Let me just say it this way. We'll give a judgment on who we have consorted with. We will stand before a God and who we have associated with. Right? I mean, we remember, you remember some of the simple verses that we're not to yoke up with unbelievers, right? Darkness and light have no communion together. Let me say it this way. Truth and lies have no communion together, right? You understand what I'm saying? We'll find out one day when we go before God. But how do we know that Paul was right? How do we know that we're in the right place? How do we know that we believe the right thing? The authority must be right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, is the establishment of what we're reading here. Okay, this letter was sent to those group of believers. They've been saved in Acts chapter 17. They're saved. That's the group that now is the church of Thessalonica. They're there. Now he's writing this letter and sending it to them. So we've seen the history or how they got saved. They believed in Jesus Christ. Their start is appropriate. Now we want to know, how do we know that that group of people is right? He's going to tell us here as he writes this letter and sends this to them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy and the Holy Ghost. What's he saying? I didn't just show up and sweet talk you and sell you into doing something. I showed up, I preached, and I lived. In other words, you saw evidence of my life. You saw my actions. I'm just going to tell you, actions speak louder than words. That's the truth. You talk a lot. Truth is, talk is cheap. How's your actions? Many times we say we love sinners. When's the last time you spoke the name of Jesus Christ? You understand? Boy, we love God. When's the last time you cried out and prayed to God? When's the last time you've opened the Bible and read the Word of God? You understand what I'm saying? Action is louder than words. So Paul shows up preaching truth, but also his life matched up with that truth. And that group of believers there witnessed that. And they saw that. And they understood that that message was not from Paul himself, but it was mixed with the Holy Spirit of God. There was power in that, so much that eyes were opened by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God, and people got saved. Lives were changed. That's what he's saying. I mean, look in chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, that's what he's talking about in chapter 1 he preached, ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it, it is truth, the word of God. So they recognized that that preaching, that message, that teaching was from God and not from Paul. The authority was from God Himself. Can I just tell you why we are who we are? It's because we say the Bible is our sole authority. It's the Word of God that's truth. This is our foundation. This is how we operate. This is what we believe, not what man's ideas are. We follow the Scripture. That's how we can know that we're right. And I'm not saying right in a prideful manner. I'm saying that because we got to go before God for an eternal loss of rewards or an eternal receiving of rewards for who we are or who we consorted with. We need to be right. And how do we know that? The authority is right. The authority is right. I'll read it to you, but you can find it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I told you we are who we are because we believe the Word of God is the authority. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
So I can know that if I follow this, the scripture, then as I go before God, my judgment will be good. I'll receive rewards. I'll know that I'm doing right because my authority is right. Number two, number two, our actions, our actions. Go back to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now remember, we've already read what happened. They showed up, they preached. Many believed. The others got envy, got angry, went against them. What they do? Now before I read this scripture, let me just ask you. How many times has someone lied about you? Do you like that? I wonder how your reaction was. Has anyone here been falsely imprisoned? How'd you feel? Has anyone here been beaten because you're trying to provide truth? Has anyone here been, you've probably been slandered? How did it make you feel? Not good. Maybe a little angry. Maybe you blew your top. Maybe you bawled them out. How was your reaction? I'm not saying anyone in this room is perfect. I understand that. But do we act in the flesh or do we act in the spirit? If you're walking with the Lord, if your relationship is close with the Lord, then you'll be able to overcome. You'll be able to overcome some of those issues when people lie against you because your actions will marry up with Scripture and your actions won't marry up with what Dean Francini wants to do. There's a difference. Our actions will evidence our heart true. Our actions will evidence whether we're right or we're wrong. Let me say it this way. Our actions will be judged as we go before God. Now here, Paul really is assaulted. He flees out of the city. Now it doesn't expound upon the issues that happened in his life, but we know for sure they didn't say, hey, Paul, can you please leave our city? Can you just leave us alone? Can you stop talking about the Word of God? No, it says they assaulted. I think they beat that house that the church was at, and Paul and Silas and Timothy saw that, and they evaded that. They left because there was a danger there. But his actions and his response are very important. That's what I want to focus on. Look with me really quick, me, quickly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, because that's the most important, how holy, justly, and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. In other words, we preached, challenged, stirred your hearts with what? The Word of God. The truth. We behaved appropriately. I wonder if that can be said about us. We've got to be careful with that. We're going to be in a judgment. How do we react to people? How do we react to those people that go against us? How do we really feel within that heart to lost people, different people than us? How do we really feel? We'll be judged for that one day, for an eternity. Life is but a vapor, right? 70 years, the average life. Eternity? Can't even imagine what that's like. That's a long time that we're going to be with God. I would say it's important that our actions are right in the eyes of God. What happens when an individual has a change in their life? For the church of Thessalonica, you can read later in Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 and find out the change in their life. But notice what Paul's actions were. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience in hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So Paul himself is praying without ceasing. Can I tell you? Those people are upon his heart. Evidencing, it evidences his love of being right. It wasn't a selfish reason. It wasn't for Paul. It wasn't for numbers. It wasn't for fame. He truly showed up there, preached the gospel, had an awful departure, and his life and his heart is softened for those people, evidencing his behavior. He could have easily got mad at them. 
He decided not to. Look also in chapter 2, verse 8. So being affectionately desirous, affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but what? Also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Well, you can see the heart of Paul for those people. His authority was right in the eyes of God, and his actions were right in the eyes of God. Lastly, lastly, there's a providence of assurance in what we believe. It's not a hope so. It's not a we'll see what happens later. We can have assurance in what we believe. According to the scripture, we can know that it's right. It's right. Look with me in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 16. Now, the Lord of peace Himself give you peace always, by all means, the Lord be with you all. Same place over in chapter 2, it talks about an everlasting. In verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. It's an everlasting. We were talking about in Sunday school, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things you may know that shall. Let me read it. I messed it up. These things, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know for sure that you have them. I can know for sure as I stand before God in the judgment that I am doing appropriate. I have assurance. I have a peace within my heart that's everlasting. I have a salvation that's everlasting. Can I tell you, no matter how you feel about the church and people out there in the world trying to cause division, the church is established. It's everlasting. Yeah, right now it's a local New Testament church, but one day when we're all gathered together in heaven, guess what? You're in church. So I hope you like it now. <laughs> Paul stood very firm on what he believed. He was concerned that people were going to mess the thing up. In verses 13 and 14 of chapter 3, you can see that. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may, that he may be ashamed. Now remember in our text, it said they that believed consorted or agreed with them. Now Paul writes in this last letter as he sends it back to Thessalonica, he says, hey, if they don't believe like we do, if they don't agree with what we do, he says, avoid them. That's what he says. Avoid them. He didn't say hate them. He didn't say look down upon them. He did say avoid them. Mark them. Know who they are. Why is that? Because they're teaching false doctrine. Their way is not going to be right before the eyes of God. That's important. So if they're teaching a false gospel or a works you must do these things, then you get saved? No, it's not right because the authority is not right. It's not coming from Scripture. You can't find that in Scripture. Make sure that our salvation is right. Make sure that our serving is right. How do we know? The authority is right. It's from God. It's the Word of God. Number two, the actions are right because it will make a change in our heart and make a change in our life. Hopefully, if you don't do right, there's a conviction that happens within your heart and you want to make that right with the Lord. You want to quit those things. The actions will be right. And you know the foundation of that, truthfully, is knowing for sure that my assurance is right. I know that I'm saved for an eternity. I know that the Word of God is right. I know that if I follow the Word of God, the Bible, then as I go before God in that judgment, it'll be right in His eyes. So it's important that we're right. We'll be judged on who we consorted or associated with. We'll be judged on our salvation. We'll be judged on our serving. So the question really is, are you right? Scripturally. It doesn't matter what book you've read. 
Doesn't matter what you've come up with. Doesn't matter what the man on the pedestal has said. What does thus saith the Lord? What does God's Word say? What does the Bible say? If we match that, it's scriptural. It's scriptural. Maybe you're sitting in this room here today and you say, well, I've heard that I've got to get rid of all of my sin. I've got to stop all my wrongdoings. Then God will save me. It's not true. It's not true. Maybe you've heard that you must be baptized and you must go to church and you must pay a tithe and you must do anything. That's not in Scripture. The Bible says, by faith, confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how you get to heaven. So if you've heard something else, I'm sorry, it's not true. You can trust it, but you're going to be the wrong judgment. So then now that I'm saved, I'm going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. How's my serving? Am I truly following the Word of God? Am I doing the Word of God? Am I listening? Am I obeying what Scripture tells me? Because I will go before God. It's not just this easy thing that I'm saved and it's done. No, now... (laughs) My life is going to be judged before God. How will your judgment be? How will you go as you go before God? What will he say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or will he say, oh my goodness, what a mess. Hold on, God. No, God's going to say, you had the word of God. I provided it for you. Here's the answers to the test. Here's the way through a good judgment. Scripture, the authority. So who are you consorting with? Whoever you consort with better have the right authority, better have the right actions, and better have the right assurance. Because if not, we will give an account of that before God one day. How will your judgment be? Father, thank you for the word of God that we've seen here. Lord, I'm so thankful that you have provided us Yes, a way of salvation. That's the most important thing. And Lord, truthfully, that's the greatest attack. The devil is trying to cause confusion in people, making them think and feel that salvation is upon them and what they do. Will they continue to do right? Will it be good enough? Uh, When I go before God, will my scale tip out that I've done good more than I've done bad? And Lord, you're just going to say one thing. Have you believed in my son, Jesus Christ? Have you, by faith, accepted my son who's already paid for the sin debt? He's already hung on the cross of Calvary. He's already been buried and risen the third day, defeating death, sin, and the grave. That is the way in. He would say, son, I told you, the Bible even says it's not by works. We want to be righteous in your eyes. And that's imputed upon us by faith, very clear in Scripture. Father, I pray that everyone here this morning can say, yep, by faith I'm saved. And Lord, I pray if not, convict them. I pray, God, they be shaken at the legs and not willing to leave out of this church until they get that right with you. Give them the boldness to come forward and ask how to be saved. Father, those of us, and I think many of us here this morning are already saved. We can say, yep, if I die right now, I'm going to heaven because of what he's done and my belief in that. But Father, how will our judgment be? What will that look like? What do you expect? Well, you've told us in the Word of God. You've given it to us. The question is, are we willing to follow that? And it's not dependent upon the situation of the world. Paul's situation was awful, and his behavior was right. His heart was right. He prayed. He continued to be concerned for those people. Continued to send men there to preach to them and teach them truth, the authority of the Word of God. And Father, I wonder if we can say here this morning, why am I here? Why am I what I am? We can say because the authority is right, our actions are right, And we have assurance, that peace that's everlasting within our hearts. Father, if there's any question on those things, I pray that you'd convict hearts, that you'd provide for them the boldness that they need to come forward and ask and get things right. Lord, now we ask that you would bless the invitation. Speak to hearts. Stir hearts, Holy Spirit of God. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. You can go ahead and stand to your feet. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart. You want to come forward and get things right? Come forward. How are your actions? If God were to judge you today, what would He see in your heart? Would it be right? Would it be wrong? Who we consort with is important. The Bible is very clear on that. We'll go before God one day on who we've consorted with. Is your salvation right? Are you sure if you die right now that you're going to heaven? The Bible is very clear. It tells us there's one way, and that's through the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please don't leave. Take some time and talk with the Lord.